All right. So our next speaker is uh, Andy Hoig, and he's a graduate student at Virginia Tech. Uh, he's finishing uh, his dissertation um, that's fo uh, focused on spatiotemporal modeling of uh, civil unrest. He enjoys predictive modeling and sports analytics, is a member of the Virginia Tech Statistics Department's basketball team, the Rapid Mixers, which he says is vertically challenged, but they make up for it by being slow. So take it away. All right, well, uh, thank you for having me. Can you guys hear this coming through the mic okay? Great. Um, the, the interesting thing about this slide, I think, is that we've actually managed to have uh, a longer list of authors than the title itself. So that's something that you don't see very often. But if you're, if you're curious, uh, Scotland Lehman is my advisor, and the rest of these authors here, Marcos, Ian, Shinran, Lucas, and Ian, are all or were graduate students in, this, uh, in our research group. So we periodically will work on interesting problems, and this actually comes from the Kaggle competition predicting March Madness a couple years ago that um, Mark organized amongst other folks. Um, so, so that's the, the actually list where the list of authors comes from. Since we're in the, the post-lunch uh, nap time, I want to have you guys do a little bit interactive uh, to start the presentation. Who's filled out an NCA bracket? I would imagine this is almost everybody in the room. Who's actually won a competition? So fewer hands. And finally, who's lost a bracket competition to, to someone that's probably never watched basketball? So I think that's, that's again, that's everybody. Uh, I can't guarantee that, that that won't happen to you again in the future, uh, but we're going to talk about some interesting things that we came up with to, to predict NCAA tournament competition. So a bit of an overview. I'm going to talk about some general strategies for NCAA tournament competitions, so both bracket competitions and this Kaggle competition, which I'll talk about in more detail soon. Then I'm going to talk about the, the methodology that we actually came up with for this talk. So uh, real quick, the idea is that we wanted to, to address this idea of matchup effects. If you watch sports media around the time of March Madness, they'll say things like Team A is a very tough matchup for Team B because they're very tall, or they shoot three-pointers well, or they rebound. And that's the kind of thing that we wanted to see if we could actually measure analytically. So that's, that's what our, our model gets at. And finally, we'll talk a little bit about the un, uncertainty that's inherent in these competitions. And that's, that's really why they're so much fun to watch and so much fun to, to participate and try and predict. So again, there are, there are two major types of, of NCA competitions, the, the bracket competition, which we mentioned pre previously. And the idea here is that you're going to predict how far a single team will advance. Oftentimes, you'll have lots of upsets. So you can imagine that one quadrant of that bracket is busted by the end of the first weekend. And you're not actually evaluated on, on any of those games that occur later because the teams that you predicted to play and that you predicted that one team would beat the other team, they've been eliminated, so they don't actually play. What the, the Kaggle competition does is you actually, before the tournament begins, you're required to submit pairwise probabilities for a team winning for each potential matchup. So you've got 68 choose two potential matchups, which is on the order of about 2,000 predictions, and then you're actually evaluated on the, the 67 or the 63, if you exclude the, the play-in games, that actually occur. From a, from a modeling standpoint, we can think about a scoring function for these traditional brackets in terms of a loss function. And uh, the idea is that the, the typical scoring for these tournaments can be one of several formats. You might have a case where you get a point for each individual game that you win. Oftentimes, the, the later games are worth more points. So if you predict the actual overall champion, for instance, that might be worth 40 or 50 points, where first round games are only worth one or five or 10 or something like that. So you can imagine there's a corresponding loss function that, that's going to actually penalize you for incorrect predictions. And that might vary by round. So this last equation here, you have an R. So that corresponds to two different rounds being worth different points. The reason that I'm actually talking about this is, is to motivate how the, the Kegel competition was actually scored. So here we have a, a loss function. If you look at it, it looks like it's the sum of the negative log of two Bernoulli probabilities. So that's the Y log P and one minus Y log one minus P. And what, what happens here, Y is actually a, 
is a binomial outcome, so it's either a one or a zero. So you can imagine that, that y corresponds to t1 winning. So one of those terms will actually cancel out. And what p is, p is the probability of that team winning the competition. As you look at this, this figure here on, on the other side of the, of the slide, you'll see that I've set it up so y equals one. So this, this considers the case where team number one wins. And if your predicted probability of victory is close to one, so if you're very certain that that team is going to win, and they actually do win, then your loss that's incurred is close to zero. However, if your loss, if your probability is close to zero, so if you're very certain that team is going to win and they do not, then you have a very large penalty, an exponential penalty. And this is actually a, what's called a proper scoring rule. And what that means is that your, your, your optimal strategy is to produce the, the true probabilities. So if you had an oracle that told you that the true probabilities, that would be the, the optimal strategy in terms of minimum expected loss in this case, or the, the risk. But that doesn't necessarily mean that maybe that's the optimal strategy or the, the optimal um, set of predictions for a single contest. You can imagine that there's only 67 games, so there's a lot of variability that um, even if you submit the true probabilities, you're not always going to win or you're not likely to win. Um, Michael, and amongst others, our, our last presenter actually has a paper on this, um, about this very contest. And I think he was actually the winner too, so if you, uh, if you want to know how to win these contests, maybe that's the person to, to talk to after this. So the idea is, is how, can we be, how can we be smarter? How can we use analytics to predict basketball games in, in general? And one idea is that you could use a lot of these team level characteristics that are out there and easily available to come up with some sort of metric for overall team strength. So some traditional ideas, you could use things like winning percentage, point differential, strength of schedule, conference affiliation, which are all very intuitive. You can use those in, in creating a model for uh, the actual team itself. This is, uh, again, NCA basketball, so we don't have a lot of the the player tracker data and things of that sort. So typically you're gonna be looking at team characteristics and, and summaries of games. Uh, you might think something like rebounding, for instance, is very important for uh, actually showing who's going to win a competition. Uh, one thing to be careful about is that you need to make sure these variables are, are going to account for things like tempo. So if you actually use total number of rebounds, that's going to be quite skewed. You could have a team like Iowa State that plays at a very fast pace and has lots of possessions. Henceforth, they will have lots of rebounds. And trying to compare that to a team like Virginia or Wisconsin that plays much slower, so they're going to have a, a smaller number of overall rebounds. But by using something like rebounding percentage, you're going to actually control for the number of, of possible rebounds. So it's a very intuitive idea, but something that's not, not always th thought about. Similarly, you can look at offensive efficiency and defensive efficiency and as a, as a more modern look to number of total number of points scored or, or points allowed. In essence, these are, are controlling for the number of possessions and are set up to be average points per possession against a, a, a typical or an average opponent. Another strategy would be, instead of trying to build this model yourself, is to use some of these publicly available ratings and rankings. If you go on the web, you'll find there's on the order of, of at least 40 or 50 rankings out there. If you're familiar with these predictive modeling competitions, the Netflix, Netflix prize, for instance, model averaging or, or ensemble methods are things that have been shown to work quite well in the past. So you could think about maybe, maybe using an approach uh, like that, where you're going to combine lots of different ratings or ranking methods to, to come up with your model that way. So I'll talk briefly about these. Uh, ESPN's Basketball Power Index is a relatively new rating system, but it has, um, has been shown to be quite predictive. The Sagarin ratings, which we'll actually use later in our methodology, are a classic. They've been around for a long, long time. And a nice feature about the Sagarin ratings is the actual difference in ratings between the two teams is the expected point differential. So there's an intuitive understanding of what the, the rating actually means. RPI is something that uh, has been shown to be less, less useful than it was originally imagined. So the RPI looks largely at your winning percentage and your strength of schedule by looking at your, the winning percentage of your opponents. And a couple more are Ken Pomeroy's ratings and as well as the logistic regression Markov chain, LRMC, from some folks at, at Georgia Tech. So 
these are ideas of, of how you might uh, use these. These are some ideas of, of ratings that are useful in, in modeling. I'm going to talk about a very general class of models, and we're going to call these relative strength models. And the idea here is they're going to use some metrics, whether it's team level characteristics or whether it's those ratings and rankings to estimate the, the strength of each team. And then your prediction would be based on some sort of relative comparison between those two teams. So a couple of really simple models in this framework would be a linear model where y, i, j would be the, the actual point spread or the point differential between the two teams. So you can imagine there's, there's some home court effect and then you're going to have some difference in those, those team strengths. So a single scalar measure of team strength, theta i and theta j and um, a normal error. So a very simple linear model in this case. You could also do a logistic regression type model where yij now is a, is a binary outcome. So it's one if team i actually wins. And you might use the, the same idea. So home court effect and then the difference in, in strengths. One of the, the challenges or, or difficulties with these models is they are what we'd say they're strictly transitive. So here's a, a formal mathematical definition of that. But the idea is that uh, if you have a team A and you expect team A to beat team B based on your, your measures of strength and you expect team B to beat team C based on your measures of team strength, that implies you're also going to expect team A to beat team C. So the, I mentioned the idea is we want to look at those matchups. So you can imagine a case where team A might match up well with team B, so you'd expect team A to win that game. Team B might match up well with team C, so you'd also expect team B to win. But there might be cases where, where Team C is actually a very difficult matchup for Team A. So we want to have a model that's going to allow us to get, to get around this idea of strict transitivity, that maybe there's something specific to Team A and Team C that you would expect Team C to beat Team A, even based on these two assumptions here. So that's, that's the idea, and that's what we're trying to, to do with our modeling framework. So we're going to do this from a, a Bayesian viewpoint. I'm going to give you a, a brief, gentle introduction of, of Bayesian modeling if you haven't seen this before. So the idea is that we start out with some prior distribution. You can imagine this beta is that beta that corresponds to the, the difference in the relative strengths in a, a simple case. So we have some prior belief on where we think that, that beta would be. You see a, a distribution here that's centered around zero with a fair amount of variability. We actually see the data. So now this blue line represents the likelihood. If you're going to fit a classical model, in this case, you would actually maximize that, that distribution there. With a, with a Bayesian distribution, we actually get something that's a posterior. So we have a prior belief on what we think, where we think that beta resides. And we see some information, and we are able to, to update our information. And we actually have a, a distribution on where we think beta resides at this point. And one of the nice things about this is then we can actually create a, a predictive distribution. So this Y star here is, the, is, a, is a point spread. So given the uncertainty in beta, we want to construct a, a model for the, the point spread. So we actually have a distribution of outcomes. And what we're going to look at here is we can actually summarize this posterior distribution to, to be the, the probability that y, is, y star is less than 0. So what that would mean would be the probability that team 1 would actually win. So the, the shaded area of this, this uh, display here is, is actually the integration. So if you have a, a point spread of about five or six based on the, a certain variability in the, in the point spread, you could, you could map this to an actual probability. So that's what we're going to do in, in our modeling framework. But uh, to, to jump back to the, the idea of these analytics for bracket competitions, when you talk about a most probable bracket, it's, it's actually usually quite boring. So you see here, I haven't filled in the first couple of rounds, but as you look at uh, the last few, like the, the, sweet, the grade eight and the final four, it's just the one seeds and the two seeds. So this is often what your bracket will look like if you use these, these kinds of methods. There are cases where you'll have some sort of analytical method that will support a team that's, that's a fairly different than the rankings. I think Louisville was a case of that a couple years ago. They were a four seed, but some, a lot of the, the analytics had them in the top four or five teams in the country. So there's a few cases where you'll see differences, but in terms of the actual probability or the probability of predicting upsets, a lot of the brackets are, are fairly bland and look like this. And maybe that's why that um, the lady that's not able to differentiate between a soccer ball and a basketball does so well is that this is what uh, the bracket ends up looking like. 
when we talk about the, the Kaggle style prediction, so in this case we're actually looking at probabilities, you're still going to get a question about predicting upsets. And in terms of, of the most probable case, it's very rare that you'll actually predict an upset. But um, consider this situation. Now here's a histogram, and imagine that these are all the people in your competition. So they're saying the prediction of, a, of an upset is, is fairly low, around 0.2. And your prediction is, is that the probability of that upset is greater. It's around 0.35. If you, someone still asks you, who do you expect to win, you're still going to say the favorite. Um, but you're able to actually show that you, you believe that it's more likely that an upset would occur in this case. So I put predicting upsets in quotations, but, but this is an idea of, of what can actually happen in a competition like this. So for each game, it's only, it's only going to occur once. So either the upset's going to happen or it's not. If the upset does happen in this case, then you would be rewarded relative to the, your, your competition, the bracket. And if it doesn't happen, if the favored team loses, then you're going to be penalized. The idea with that um, proper scoring function is that if when you say that an upset's going to happen with probability of 0.35, in the long, the long run, if it happens with that actual probability, then you, you're going to have the optimal score. That doesn't mean that in a, in a single competition that's the case, though. So here's a quote, and I think this is a, a good motivating quote for our, our framework. So I apologize, but I'm going to actually read it to you. This is from Andy Enfield, who was the former head coach at Florida Gulf Coast and now is at USC. <coughs> he was actually asked, do you see any upsets in this competition, or, or how do you go about predicting upsets? And he says, well, it's hard to predict a particular team. You have to look at the higher seed and see, do they overwhelm the smaller school or the lower seed? Can they overwhelm someone with their athleticism or length or size or quickness or speed? Do they play a particular style of pressure defense? And I think I look at the lower seed then and I say, can they counter the higher seed's strength? Do they shoot the three-point shot well? Do they have athleticism at certain positions? Do they play a particular style that will give the higher seed trouble? So he's, he's definitely talking about specifics between two teams when you look at a matchup. And that's something that, that doesn't come through in those relative strength metrics. So last year, you may have heard that Kentucky had an outstanding team and was very, very tall. So it's likely that you would hear someone say that Kentucky is going to be a difficult matchup for any team because of their height. Well, that's part of it, but it's also because they're very good. So we need to be able to, to factorize or to, to account for the actual team quality when we're talking about these, these matchups. So for instance, a lot of people have mentioned the Golden State Warriors throughout the morning. They're not as tall as the, the Kentucky team was, but they're also very good. So if the idea of height is the, the factor that's going to cause the matchup difficulties, we need to be able to control for the, the actual quality of the team. <coughs> so here's, here's a little bit of intuition about what we're trying to do. You can imagine that this represents games. So the way we're able to, to actually get at the quality of a team is based on their observations, so how they perform in the games. So each of these black dots represents some realization from each of these games that we're going to use to, to measure how well or how strong that team is. So a simple way you could, you could look at estimating that team's strength would be that horizontal line right there. So that's your estimate of, of this team's strength. But imagine that that team was actually playing sort of two latent subclasses of teams, two different kinds of teams in some sense. And one team, they're actually going to perform better against than the other. So maybe in, in reality, you're going to see something like this. So the maroon line corresponds to the maroon dots. So maybe they perform better against those kinds of teams and perform worse against the orange teams that are the, the, the triangles there. That's the idea, is that we want to be able to, to get at this kind of effect if it exists. So the way that we're actually going to fit this model is that there's three real components. So the first piece is to fit that relative strength model that, that I talked about. And that gives us a, a way to, to actually measure how well they're performing against expectations. And then given that, we're going to, to look for teams that are, that are similar for a given matchup. So imagine that Harvard and Yale are playing basketball tomorrow. If we wanted to, to perform our model on this, this particular matchup, we look at everyone that Harvard's played in the past that's similar to Yale in some sense and see how well they performed. If they performed, say, 10 or 15 points better than expected against teams like Yale, 
it's reasonable to assume that they would also perform better than expected against Yale. So that's, that's the idea with, uh, with our, our framework. So part two is how do we actually identify neighbors that are similar to a team like Yale? And calibrating the matchup adjustment is, is a way to estimate how much of that uh, improved performance actually is, is passed forward in the, the next phase. <clears throat> so this is the actual specific model that we use. We use the, the Sag Sagarin ratings and a home corn effect for estimating them. Of course, the NCA tournament itself is on neutral sites, so the home, home court effect drops out of the model. And you have to end up with a very simple linear model looking at the, the difference in, in the Sagarin ratings. And again, this model on its own has that strict transitivity property. And the, the next idea is, is how, do we see, how do we know that teams are, are similar? So what we did is we grabbed a whole collection of team characteristics from Ken Pomeroy's website. And some of these are effective height. So this actually looks at the heights of your inside players with the idea that it's more valuable if your, your power forward and your centers are extremely tall relative to having an extremely tall point guard. Adjusted tempo is, is how fast, how many possessions you're playing with. An effective field goal percentage defense is uh, controlling again for three-point shots and two-point shots and, and free throws. So there's a, there's a whole slew of characteristics here. And the idea becomes, how do we actually, how do we weight these? And this is where, if you remember that very long list of authors, some of these folks are doing research in visual analytics. So we, we use some of their methodology. So it's kind of hard to see the team names here, and I apologize for that, but this is actually a multi-dimensional scaling representation based on all of these characteristics. So the idea is that if two teams are very similar, are very close in this picture, then they're very similar. And this is actually weighting all those variables I talked about equally. Another way you might do that is you might say, well, I'm interested in things like height efficiency and, and block percentage, which would be the number of, or the proportion of shots that a team blocks. And then you would actually reset your figure and teams would now be similar based on the, the distance of this, this new weighting scheme. An interesting idea that we actually played around with a little bit is that maybe you actually watch basketball games and you say, well, I think two teams are similar, but I'm not really sure what characteristics are driving that. So with this, this interactive software, you can actually drag the points around and say, okay, Creighton and Iowa State, this is back when Doug McDermott still played for Creighton, are very similar in their style of play. What characteristics are, is it that are, they're actually driving these similarities? So these are all different ideas on how you might actually come up with those, with those weights. And you see in this case, this is the, the example I just mentioned with Iowa State and Creighton being similar. It's the assist rate and the turno turnover percentage are things that, that are similar. <clears throat> so here's a, an example that I'm actually gonna, gonna talk through in a little bit more detail later. But um, so in, in this, this tournament, Dayton and Stanford was one of the games. And we might look and see who are those teams that Dayton's played that are similar to Stanford. And there's a list of five teams there. Um, coincidentally, George or Georgia, or I guess teams that start with G seem to be similar to Stanford, but obviously that's, that's not a part of the methodology. Um, but the idea here is that you could think about adjusting the number of neighbors. One thing about this methodology is it really depends on uh, a history of, of competition for that, that season. If you're trying to fit this model, early in the season where you've only played two or three or even eight or ten games, you're going to have a hard time identifying those teams that are similar to the, the actual current matchup. So it works much better at the, the final NCAA tournament level where you've played on the order of, of 30 games or so. Now here's a, a little bit of math. So look, walking through this equation, <clears throat> what we're going to do here is this is the idea of, of how, how a team has performed relative to expectations for that particular game. So what the, the K inside this equation corresponds to is the number of neighbors. We've set that to, to equal five in most of our cases. It's not very um, sensitive to say four, five, six, something like that, that range. It doesn't seem to have a, a large impact. N sub J are the neighbors. So, so neighbors for team I with respect to team J. So those are, those are teams that team I has played previously that look a lot like team J and YIK is the actual observed point spread between team I and team K, and then the mu IK is the actual expected point spread, and that mu is actually coming from the, the relative strength model. 
So the idea here is that we have an Rij that says how well does team I perform against teams like team J and vice versa, an Rj of I, so how well team J is performing against teams like team I. And then we actually have this variable rho. And rho is going to control how much information is passed from the neighbors. And you can think of this, if this rho is zero, then we're not able to actually implement any matchup effect. We're not able to, to model it. And if it's greater than zero, then there's, so, there's some value in this methodology. <clears throat> With that, that previous uh, predictive distribution I talked about hypothetically quite a few slides back, you can think of this in the same way. And what actually happens is that phi term, which is the, the rho times rij and rji, is actually a shift in the expected point differential. So this is where the non-transitivity comes in the model. And uh, just one real quick table here that's going to show that we're actually able to estimate this row. It's, it's fairly small, but it is, it is a meaningful result nonetheless. And this was estimated over tournaments from 2007 to 2013, so a fair number of, of entries, not a single competition. And um, here's a, a couple of slides that, that, that walk through it a little bit um, more detail. So this was the 2014 competition. And here are the, the 10 games with the highest fee value. So you see that those values are all relatively small, generally less than about three points. So it's often the case that you're not going to actually change your predicted winner. But in these competitions where the, you're evaluating your probabilities, three points can be a, a fairly large shift in a, in a prediction of a, a probability. And that three-point shift is the Dayton-Stanford game that I mentioned. And we see that Dayton had performed very, very well against teams like Stanford. So here's the actual results against these teams. So they were performing about 15 points better than expected against teams like Stanford. And Stanford performed pretty close to the, the expected score against teams like Dayton. So what we get from this case is that we think Dayton's going to match up quite well with, with Stanford. And we actually see that in this n equals 1 observation case for this specific um, instance that it actually worked out well. Um, but um, again, those, that row was estimated over the course of about six or seven NCAA tournaments. But um, this was the, the most interesting one to talk about. Some, some final ideas about competitions of this sort in general. It's, it's really hard to, to do an evaluation when you're, there's such a small number of data points. So even if you, like I said before, even if you know that the true probability is to submit that, there's no guarantee that you're actually going to, to win or be in the money in this kind of competition. And I talked about the idea of a, of a proper scoring rule. One way to think about this specific competition is that the first two teams were giving, given large cash prizes, I think about $10,000 for the winning team and $5,000 for the second place team. And the third place team received uh, $0. So, so maybe your loss function is actually something different than your actual score. Maybe it's some sort of expected return. And that might lead you to, to take a, a different strategy than, than an optimal strategy for minimizing your expected risk. And finally, if you're curious how our, our team has done in this competition, so the first year we were in about the top 25th percentile, and last year we were in about the top 10th percentile. So if you fit a, a linear trend there, we're going to finish in about negative 30th next year, which uh, should be pretty good. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and stop now, and I'll take any questions. Yeah, you, you mentioned there's no home uh, advantage because they don't play at home, but they do play in regional areas. So if Duke's playing in Indianapolis versus playing in Washington, that should have an effect. The other thing is also about number of seniors versus freshmen, the Wisconsin-Kentucky mm -hmm. type of thing. Do you factor that in at all as well, experience? So the, the number of, of upperclassmen is an interesting factor. So we looked at that, and in a lot of cases you saw a negative relationship because of uh, a thing like Kentucky, where they have all these fantastic underclassmen. Um, but we're not directly factoring that in. It's probably in included in the, that team strength measure in some sense. And um, I've looked at the idea of, yeah, Duke going to play in Charlotte's not exactly on the road. Um, but I didn't include that in this particular work here. <laughs>